Today's episode of The Watch was brought to you by a Game of Thrones Enhanced Edition. Andy, George R.R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones. Uh, it's it, There's a new iBooks version of this called uh, Enhanced Editions, and it is just bringing these storylines, these characters, to life in a fun and interactive way. If you, like us, have been on the fence about reading the Song of Ice and Fire series, the five books that have been out there informing the TV show that we all know and love, this is the time to get in. These books are really, really cool. The Enhanced Editions, every chapter, there is a map showing you where the characters are. Every character name is clickable for a hyperlink explaining who they are, what their sigil is, what the heck they're doing, and where they've been. It is the most immersive way to experience George R. R. Martin's crazy in-depth books. You go from ba- being like basically a remedial fan of this story to being a professor of this story. These books are available exclusively on iBooks. You can go to apple.co slash Game of Thrones. Again, apple.co slash Game of Thrones. Check them out. They are not available in all countries, but they are probably available where you live. And if you've been thinking about getting into the books or if you've read the books and wanted more deeply immersive, interactive experience, can't recommend this more highly. It's George R.R. Martin's Game of Thrones Enhanced Editions. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by the second season of HBO's Insecure. Creator and star Issa Rae is back with a brand new season of her deeply relatable series about friends, love, and L.A. Set in Inglewood, season two of Insecure finds Issa dealing with the fallout of her infidelity and resulting breakup with long-term boyfriend Lawrence. Despite her attempts to maintain a positive facade, Issa secretly hopes that she can win him back. Meanwhile, though, he is still conflicted about his feelings for Issa. Lawrence begins to move forward without her. This summer, Insecure isn't holding back, and life is hella out there. Watch the season two premiere of Insecure July 23rd at 10.30 p.m. on HBO. I need sports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Now. Hello, and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan, and I am an editor from TheRinger.com, and joining me in the studio, he just got done with latrine duty, it's Andy Greenwald! They never tell you that that's the other side of soup duty. Yeah, you know what? I did not have a work study in, in college, but I imagine that that's what it would have been like. I feel like that's what internships at The Ringer are like. Andy, welcome to The Watch. It's Monday. We are part of The Ringer Podcast Network, a network I'm proud to be a part of. Shout out to House of Carbs. Shout out to Big Picture, Achievement Oriented, Binge Mode, All the Fam, Bachelor Party, Jam Session. I, the ones you're leaving out are going to be salty. Who's a, who am I leaving out? NFL show, NBA show, MLB show. You say Shack House? Uh, Shack House is my favorite golf podcast. <laughs> I know that. Um, Andy, we're here. It's Monday. It's the Monday after Game of Thrones Season 7 premiere, so obviously we're going to talk about that. Thank you to everybody who reached out, who watched last night's Talk yeah, of Thrones tweeted. on Twitter. Uh, it. You know, it was it was actually just an awesome experience. People were corresponding with us during the show, interacting. We had a lot of fun. We We've felt had a blast. We enjoyed watching the show. We were so happy to have Jason and Mallory with us. We even enjoyed working together, so that was nice. <laughs> um, it was. I hope people checked it out. You can still watch it. There's still a yes. lot of confusion. You can watch it live, uh, and then you can continue to watch it. And you can the watch best, it whenever you want. The it's best on, way to find like, it. If is, you look at the Ringer's Twitter feed, yeah. at my Twitter feed, at Greenwald's Twitter feed, I'm sure at Mal and Jason's. I, I muted them. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Come on. This was a really, for us, we had a lot more fun doing it this way, I can say, than we did last year. I think that's that's okay to say. I it, was not it, on ketamine, so that was like a big step That up. was a big difference. I was not on that, that Delta Chardonnay life that's like right. I was last year. No. It was nice to be here. Yeah, it was awesome to have the gang back together. It was awesome to talk about the show. There was like a lot of genuine just sort of like excitement in the room watching it. We watched it separately last year. We watched it in New York and LA. Yeah. And to get just be all in the same room uh, checking it out together You were kidding blast. about what it's like watching it with Mallory. She's intense. I had no idea. She, she feels it. That's what makes her genius. I, I watched it in a room alone with Jason last year, and he's just very very studious. Yes. Which is just taking notes. Yeah. Um, this is this is going to be fun this year. Very studious, very uh, loose with the lives of children when it comes to bargaining. Yeah, apparently, we're going to get to that. Um, <laughs> um, no, so you can watch us every Sunday after the scenes from next week of the East Coast airing of Game of Thrones. So that's like roughly 7.05, but these episodes will get longer as the mm-hmm. season goes on, I imagine. Um, then we're doing the watch Mondays and Thursdays. Obviously, Mondays are going to be dedicated to Game of Thrones, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, binge Mode Podcast is going to continue throughout the season and we'll go on Wednesdays. So you can find stuff on the ringer.com about Game of Thrones like any and all times. Allison Herman has a recap up. 
Andrew Grotadaro already wrote about that Ed Sheeran cameo that Andy the, loved so much. This is all, I think, kind of makes The Ringer an outlier on the internet in that sense, right? Yeah, that well, you can we're, find Game we're, of Thrones content We're on We're like just, we're going our own way. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if people want to follow our path, they can come on this journey with us. Leaders lead. Yeah, that's right. I think that's really... I hear the NBA is coming soon, too. Like, everybody's been talking, like, on, on like, sub-sub-subreddits, yeah. people are like, the NBA is pretty cool, so we might start... T- Kick into that. That's too. okay. You should follow that wherever it leads. Um, Andy, so let's talk a little bit about Thrones we have for other a while, stuff coming and then today. we were going to talk about. We have a couple of observations about the <laughs> Disney con- convention that happened this weekend. People love our in Los Angeles. A lot of news came out about Star Wars and Avengers and some other Marvel stuff. So we wanted to talk a little bit about that, and we also we're going to just do a kind of random but still fun. Uh, recap of the end of Master of None because uh, Andy finished that. I feel like you can put this on me as being the slow poke. I think maybe other Americans took their time watching this Emmy nominated series. And so we give people, we talk about it. I feel like this is the new model, especially for these binge shows. We talk about yeah. it when it There's debuts. something very funny going on right now with my, my binging. Yeah. That if I don't finish the season in the, the sustained, like, okay, we're watching two a night thing. Yeah. I never do. I, we had to finish, like, I had to finish House of Cards because I was like, I felt myself fading. Yeah, that's been my model, what you're saying. I think Daredevil season two is uh, is waving at me from a distance <laughs> yeah. very far away. 31 minutes in. But yeah. uh, but with these, especially, like, I, I, it's well established that I prefer the 30-minute shows for binging. <laughs> your, I just think, your time is important. Well, <laughs> it's also, it's just more, I think it's more pleasurable. They feel more snackable yeah. in that way. But even so, I don't want to watch more than three in a night because you get burnt out on them. So yeah. I think, you know, for for um, Master of None, for Glow, which I hopefully, I think will hopefully hit on Thursday of this week, we'll come back to. Yeah, sure. Let's get um, to Glow and Peaks on Thursday. Yeah, so we'll... we'll Peaks I have to watch night of. Last night I came home Did from, you go home and watch course. Peaks last night? Damn. I can't live in a world. Where, where like other people are up on Peaks. And no, where it just exists and I haven't seen it. That's so I came great. Home. That's fandom. Let me Shout tell out you, to you. Two nice things. Three nice things last night. Okay. Came home from our show. Beautiful evening in Los Angeles. Sun setting. Uh, turns out there was a Fleetwood Mac concert at Dodger Stadium Class- last the night. Classic. It's called the Classic Festival. Yeah, it the Eagles are really played. It really pains me that I was not there, but I could hear Rhiannon full blast from Whoa, my backyard. Really? Which was interesting. That was actually just me of the boombox in your backyard. I, I, that was <laughs> That's so okay. sweet of you. Say anything. That came home to find that my wife, who does not watch Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. watched our show, which I really appreciated, and then had an episode of Twin Peaks waiting for me. My mom is not going to be watching Talk <laughs> the Thrones this year because she's afraid of getting hacked. That's fair. Yeah. That's that's totally fair. Um, let's talk a little bit about the episode uh, with a little bit of time to digest. So okay. season seven premiere, Dragonstone. Last night on Talk of the Thrones, we went into all the vagaries of like why Dragonstone is important, and the various families it's hosted, and it's overcast yeah. uh, walls. You hate Dragonstone. I like, I'm fine with Dragonstone, but let's not pretend like Dragonstone's the goal. That's my thing. When you go on That's like a- being like, we, we're, we're the NL East champs. It's like, come on. Oh yeah, Big, when you put up like goal. yeah. When they put up like the division champ yeah. banner, yeah, I agree. Or, or how about if you have like a eight hour drive and it's getting late and you're tired, but you're like an hour and a half away and there's a motel. It's like do you do you stop? Never. You just push through. Drive all night. Drive all night. <laughs> Trucker speed. Yeah. Man, Get there. On. It was interesting for me because, uh, you know, I, I I wondered if there would be a little bit more um, kind of a mezzo mezzo reaction to the episode because it was relatively stayed they was throw clearing mm-hmm. exposition um but the truth is this is a show that people love this is a show that we love it's fun to get back into it and so this is and they've learned at this point seven seasons in the first the season premiere is the time to just show off where your your chess pieces are to literally draw a map on the ground yeah <laughs> to remind people because everyone's just happy to be there yeah there's a couple of real flex moments where i felt like I mean, we had noticed last season that maybe Getting off book was allowing um, the writers of the show mm-hmm. to imbue it with some of their own personalities, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, I mean, I, forgive me if I'm wrong, but a scene like the Sam montage, which uh, was went from nauseating to hilarious. Yeah. I don't think they would have done that in the first few seasons. No, and it. I agree, both in terms of the just the fun of it, the sort of the lightness, the humanity of it, and also it served a purpose because it yada yada 
the repetition of his life because by the end of the episode, he found what he was looking yeah, for or the beginning of it. They're going to have to do a lot of stuff with time over the night. And I'm not mm-hmm. talking about Bran's vision in the beginning of the, the episode. I mean, literally, there are people cro- crisscrossing oceans with mm-hmm. boats of varying degrees of, of seaworthiness. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, and I, I ain't talking about Davos here. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we said last night on Talk the Thrones that... Um, I, that things seem almost impossible without some serious go fast boats because the hound and Barrack and Thoros appear to be moving northward mm-hmm. into the snow towards Eastwatch by the sea, yes. where a big battle seems to be brewing. Sure. The other thing we know from hanging out with Mallory and Jason is that they want and expect the hound to fight the mountain. Right. Which would have to happen in King's Landing and probably has to happen concurrent with the fall of the Lannisters, probably. Because how do you get to Cersei? I mean, unless it's an inside job from her brother, but yeah. that's a whole separate issue. But so that's a lot of up and down still to come, all for things that are not probably the end of the season. So yeah, so there's, yeah. there's going to be a lot of that. So there's a lot of stuff going on. It was definitely a, like a d- degree of a throw clear- clearing episode. What do you want to touch on first? Yeah. I mean, like, well, I would like to take a moment here because on Talk the Thrones and on binge mode, there's going to be a lot of room for speculation about deep specific things to the Martin verse. But I was struck by um, a piece that Matt Zoller Seitz wrote for Vulture today, his review of, of the season premiere. And basically in the piece, he says, and I can just say what it was called, um, Game of Thrones has become more empathetic and complex in its final leg. And he's making, essentially he's written down the argument that we've been batting around uh, verbally on the show, which is that there really seems to have been a difference when they threw off the shackles of the books. Now, that's not fair to call them shackles, Mm -hmm. but that the thing that he didn't like as a viewer, and I think I would agree with this, as a pure viewer, the only thing about the show that sometimes rubbed us the wrong way seemed to come from a slavish devotion to just dumping plot, Mm -hmm. to doing justice to the stories or at least the major plot points and characters as written in the book. It could feel stilted. Episodes could feel like info dumps in a way. Now, they were the most glorious info dumps ever recorded on television, but they could feel that way. And there suddenly was, and this is interesting because the plot got a lot darker in a lot of ways last year and there's a lot more death to come, but the show felt lighter in all senses. There was more room for humanity, for jokes, for um, Samuel Tarly mega mixes. And, heavy, and heavier. I mean, I thought that well, I mean, in, in a sense that it had a, an emotional resonance that I think that for me... I ne- you know, like the scene just between and all jokes aside about their like sexual relationship, but the Cersei and Jamie mm-hmm. scene where he's just like, we haven't even talked about the yeah. fact that our kid swan dived out of his house, yes. you know, and she's just like, that's like th- that was essentially, you know, like an Edward Albee scene or whatever. Yeah, that is let- just like a new your usual domestic heartbreak over the tragic loss of a child that gets swept aside literally because they're standing on a map of the known world that they're going to try and dominate. Yes, and let's always remember the human cost of it. Let's remember the engagement of fans like us who are watching this in ways similar to the way we watch other television shows, which demands um, emotional check-ins on where we are with Mm -hmm. these people and their lives and their choices and their hardships. Um, I thought it was telling that for the super, super fan, not just Mallory and Jason, but the book readers, um, that it was so clear cut that the most important thing that happened last night was Daenerys and the dragons returning to Dragonstone. Yes, that is hugely important for the forward momentum plot of the show. Mm -hmm. No question. It is unspeakably important for people who have been immersed in this world for 20 years to see something that they've been waiting for. I don't mean to discredit that at all or devalue that at all. But for TV viewers who are watching more cumulatively in a shorter amount of time, um, having the space for those emotional moments to remember why we care about these things, not just because it's cool or not just because we're headed towards something that has been promised, really matters. Yeah, yeah. Um, And so I was thinking that, you know, this is a a recurring theme for us across a number of series that I think we agree on, that TV shows, especially in this age of inventiveness in terms of narrative storytelling, TV shows teach us how to watch them. We are not always prepared for what the show is going to be, how we engage with it week to week, whether we binge it, whether we space it out. Um, Game of Thrones, as with so many other things, has completely, completely redefined what it means to watch and engage with something, you know, because the other aspect of Matt Seitz's piece that I thought was noteworthy was he was talking about last night's episode and he was talking about things that in his mind seemed to tweak the gender and sexual politics that were divisive earlier in the season. 
Um, early seeing, in the series. Sorry, early yeah, in yeah. the series, correct. Yeah. Seeing Arya wipe out a family of murderous, rapey men, for right. example. Um, the looks that Brienne and Sansa exchange when Lyanna Mormont is just dunking on dudes mm-hmm. in the Great Hall of Winterfell. I think that's a valid point to make. But I would also argue, and this was very difficult to argue when I was in the trenches of writing about each episode, that maybe this was the point of Martin's books all along, which was he was showing, and and of the show, showing the horror of the world and the misogyny and cruelty and violence of the world in total because there was a long arc towards showing something different. That's an impossible argument to make for a TV show full stop. You can't say, well, we're going to do this in season three because it's going to pay off in season seven. Only Game of Thrones had the long game to be able to do that. And I think on some level, that's what they were doing. But it's also what made the job of those of us who were in the trenches episode to episode mm-hmm. and made our job impossible. I love writing those recaps of every episode for Granlin. I don't envy those who still have to do it. To read Alan Sepinwall last night, he's like, well, it, it's bogged down again in a way. Because mm-hmm. It bogged down in the sense that yeah. this was an episode that, did, that gave 10 minutes to every character incrementally. One thing about Benioff and Weiss they have been consistent with this. They have never cared about the episode as an individual art form, for the most part. Um, I would, whether they care about it or not, I'm not going to ascribe like authorial intent to them, but they've got it because yesterday was essentially like a pop culture Super Bowl, you know, in terms of everything from the countdown clock to the extent mm-hmm. to which I mean, there's post game shows. Obviously, there's shows, there's other shows, and Gizmodo's got a show. Like these other places, you know. Uh, we have experts, we have pundits, we have yeah. analysis, we have play-by-play. Um, so, yeah, they may think of one as a prelude or a prologue to two, or they may think next season is going to be three films, or however yeah. this winds up getting divided up in their head. Whether they like it or not, and whether we like it or not, and I, I love it. I mean, there's just... I, every week I feel behind on things, but so, you know, Game of Thrones is something that, like... Whether I was doing yes. the show or not, I would just be like, "It's Sunday at five thirty. Let's sit down." You know what I mean? Like, let's do this. I completely agree with you. I uh, guess what I what my, just to clarify what I was saying more is that, um, you know, to to watch an episode of Game of Thrones on a Sunday, second or third episode, everything you're saying is what it has become. That's how we watch it, mm-hmm. and how we celebrate, it, and how we engage with it. The old the old world, which is suitable since the old world is dying away on the show of watch the episode, and then the episode had specific themes, a point of view about one character, a storyline that didn't end in that episode, but was, you know, had a, had a had some significant inflection points. And then we write a recap of it and sort of tussle over the meaning of that episode in miniature. Mm-hmm. Has never really applied to Game of Thrones. I guess it's always guess right. been about the larger experience. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? It's funny because you mentioned themes, and one of the things I wanted to talk about was the subtle theme that came out last night of... Um, the way the information gets shared within the world of the show. So uh, my favorite part, one of my favorite parts was the Jim Broadbent scene where he's this archmaster yes. and he's going through this uh, so good. Um, dissection of a, of a corpse and um, autopsy or whatever. And they're weighing these organs and Sam's just like covered in blood after being covered in God knows what uh, beforehand. And they're talking about whether or not the White Walkers are going to be able to get through the wall or what, what mm-hmm. Sam's seen and all this stuff. In the uh, dragon stone, dragon glass, and he's like, you know, Broadbent basically says this thing, which is very funny after you know the year or so that we've had in this country or whatever. But where he's just like, yeah, you know, people thought the world was going to end here and here and mm-hmm. here, and it almost did here. But every time the world didn't end, and every time we're the institutional memory for the world, like we are men's memory, and without memory, guys are just. We're, Men are just dogs. And this show has done a lot to show that men can be dogs. But I thought it was and fascinating. Dogs can eat men. I thought it was really, really interesting to see, you know, it's something we don't talk about a lot, but how do people learn things on this show? Mm-hmm. And there is like the, they have the get out of jail free card with um, Ravens. Like you can just be like, send a Raven. And mm-hmm. that just kind of knocks it out. But Jason was obviously getting like agitated at one point i can't remember what the scene was maybe it was when when sam reads about the dragon glass right. underneath dragonstone or the like the yeah. underground mountain on dragonstone of Gra- dragon glass and he was like send a raven send a raven like get it and you realize like john didn't know about the knights of the veil until you know they came mm-hmm. through and saved the day and he's still pretty salty about it you yeah. know and 
Sam is down here in the Citadel, but he has information he needs to get to points north. And you've got people who are operating in parallel tracks of each other and not knowing mm-hmm. where they don't know that Euron has gotten to King's Landing and left. You know, I mean, when do they find these things out? And there's the Varus' spies and there's Ravens, but I think that the flow of information is actually going to be a subtly important thing on this show. And belief in that information, I, trusting that God yes, imagine. Sam is right. They, they and and you may have looked into a fire for this, but it's important for us to get to the ocean castle in the north. That's one, the thing, you know. One thing that makes me think of that is particularly interesting about Game of Thrones and relevant to our life is the classism in the faith of, built into this bedrock faith and in institutions, mm-hmm. which is to say, the Archmaester is saying, "We are the memory of the world." Without us, men are dogs. Without us, all it all would have ended, mm-hmm. but it didn't. And it's we are able to sit here and weigh hearts and minds and basically be like, we're we're going to be fine. Um, for as much as they know about the world, the man, the man and his daughter, whose skeletons we saw, didn't matter to them. You know what I mean? Like the show does did, did a very nice job of reminding us of how the little people in this world, yeah, not the, the soldiers heroes, that Arya met on the road, yeah. get chewed up and spit out, and it doesn't matter what people knew or didn't know. Yeah, For that man and his daughter, it got cold, and they couldn't have food anymore. Like, you don't need to be an archmaester to know that. Yeah. You just, it doesn't help you, so why should you care? So, we, you know, and that, that is, an, all of the stuff the archmaester's saying is essentially human, right? Like, if we don't know things, then we are animals. But also knowing that if you don't have food and it's cold, you will die is also essentially human. Yeah. And to try to stretch this, I don't know how I can do this. I might need your help on this. But we do live in an era now, right, where we all feel entitled to not only know everything, but reap the benefits of everything. Yeah. And I don't want to say feel entitled because we should. We should all be able to not die and be right. cared for when we're sick. But that's a separate digression. But this idea of, okay, so you... You can barricade knowledge. Right? I, I'm jumping all over. No, the place, I mean but you I can think keep the, knowledge the, the, the locked up. Perfect example we were talking about is the climate change debate that happened out of the New York Magazine article right. last week, okay. where it was just like there was this immediate cycle of something was a story, and you know, not a it's obviously not a story, not a story like fiction, but there was a there was a piece, and then there was an immediate backlash to that piece from various sides, mm-hmm. and then there was this defense of the piece that happened, and by the end of the week, it would be the story had become more about. The piece, the footnotes, this, that, the mm-hmm. other thing, than it was, are we flying into the sun? Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, I think that that happens a lot because you have so much access to everybody having um, a voice, and which is at once great and at once, de- you know, it can be not oh. great. And then, so I think actually that does apply to what we're yes. seeing where if people think that Sam is scaremongering or if people think that Sam doesn't, hasn't cleaned out enough bath t- bathroom pots to earn the right to get to read mm-hmm. a certain book, that's going to slow down response time when they have well, to like. Well, let's that it's a great analogy actually because let's talk about the reaction to that New York Magazine piece. One of which was scientists saying, "Oh, don't scare people." Yeah, right. Stop it. Like because when faced with existential destruction, doomism, people throw up their hands. But if instead you say, "Well, if you take your kombucha bottles and you put them in the blue container," You're going to help. Yeah. People like to do, you know, think global, act I'm local. ready to join Owen Wilson Yeah, and and just dig you and had, whatever we need to do. You had me at <laughs> let's join Owen Wilson. <laughs> but that is relevant to this show because you have John in the John and Sansa scenes, for example, where John is saying, I have seen literally the king of death. Yeah, word. Coming. And she's just, yeah. And she's like, you forgot that Cersei Lannister is also your And he's enemy. like, that, she's like a thousand miles away. Yeah. We're like, you see the snow, that's bad. Yeah. It, it, it is, that is one of the most interesting and essential things of being human, which is how do we manage, like, I have a tummy ache today, but also democracy is dying. Well, there's also, how I love how, that? you know, we've talked about how, um, you know the, the books obviously create a huge amount of history. This show has been going on long enough to have its own history, and I think people identify very closely uh, with the actors and with the you know with the performances, but also with the characters as we see them on the screen. And that was one of the a really interesting scene when Sansa and John are having this debate about uh, 
you know, what makes a good ruler? And she's like, you're a good ruler. You know, mm-hmm. I, I've, and she's obviously been around a few. But she's saying, like, I've learned a lot. You know, Cersei taught her a lot. And yeah. that this idea that, um, you know, you can't make the same mistakes that the other Stark men made. Mm-hmm. You can't make the mistakes of, um, you know, basically kindness that, that Rob and Ned made. Uh, and, and whether or not, like, you'll survive that. And it that was like a very, I felt like that was a very, and Jason had a different reaction, I think, than you did. And I, it was very interesting to see, like, some people being like, Sansa's right. Like, they, yeah, well, because Jason is watching the show as a scholar, mm-hmm. you know, and not just like a sports fan, but like this has been his life for the last few months and the books for even longer. And so he, you know, he, and he's been continuing this argument on Twitter today, basically saying like, John really fucked up. Yeah. John needed to take those children. He didn't have to kill them, but he should have just taken them prisoner. He needed to do this, and he's going to be punished for it. And, you know, I, I, I let me just apologize in advance because I generally don't love, like, who in politics is the Game of Thrones character? Sure. You know? But let's think about the the idea of they go low, we go high, right? Uh-huh. A very large frustration that the left, and I include ourselves in this, had with President Barack Obama was – just crush him. Get it done. Why is he always trying to be – why is he always taking the high road? Well, that was that was more something that came out during the election. No, I I think, no, but that was the that was the criticism throughout. Like why is he negotiating a grand bargain with John Boehner? Why does he feel like it is important to do this? You right. know, they will never work with you. I think why it was are you because he wanted to participate in some of the traditions and pageantry of the office just the same way but that he, he didn't come out the day after the election and was like – that's what I mean. He was like, but no, he there's a wanted, process. This has a demo. There's a not just a process, but these things are delicate. Yeah. And if we do not behave in a certain way, they will fall apart. Right. And we need to hold up our end of the bargain, even when another side might not be holding up their end of the bargain. Or we need to try to. Yeah. And if he was, that. I think that if he wanted to get into a, like, so, a more detailed argument with Sansa, he could have said something to the extent when she's just like, these people fought for Ramsay. And he was like, yeah. And to like kill them. And throw and give their houses to other people would be something Ramsey would right. do. And so this, and she might say, "I know he was doing very well until I came along this, with the Knights of the Vale." This speaks to, I think, one of the more fascinating. They should have a part in the interruption where it's just John and Sansa arguing with each other about this stuff. But this is one of the more fascinating windows uh, into the show, and I think into fandom, mm-hmm. and in terms of what we want out of storytelling, because I still have an optimistic, romantic vision of fiction, right, where I want Jon Snow to be like Ned yeah. and be a good leader and a better leader in some ways. And there are other people who are like, you need to be a street fighter. You need to hire Roger Stone and you need to hire him for your side yeah. or else you won't win. And that's Sansa. And that might be Sansa's the divide. Roger Stone. <laughs> no, she'd hire Roger. <laughs> Littlefinger is Roger Stone, obviously. Yeah. I'm just doing literally now the thing yeah. I said I wouldn't do. But what you know? I need to make a special request for Concepcion to do a, a, an info wars as Littlefinger. He could do one. Yeah. I just mean that this is the this is the end game that is more fascinating in many ways than the game that we've seen up to this point. The show taught us for many seasons that heroes aren't going to win, that idealism is going to be punished, that Prince Valiant is going to have his head cut off. Mm-hmm. Now we are into the end game, and it does seem set up for good to prevail. I mean, we're going to lose some pals along the way, but good is going to prevail to some degree. I mean, it would be rough if the Night, night King is just like, gotcha, yeah, and I won. The, and that's the end. And <laughs> then he winks. Nice. Yeah. Um, so okay. that'll be the thing to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors, and then we'll be back. We're going to talk a little Avengers, Star Wars, and Master of None. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Hotel Tonight. If you are like me and you're not so great at planning ahead... I've got news for you. There is this awesome app called Hotel Tonight that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the last minute. I just used it this weekend to wow. goon it up in Laguna Beach. Went to Temu Salani's Steakhouse. Those are so many words. I don't really... You, you, you wonder about the steps you take in life that lead you to Temu Salani's Steakhouse, but... At least you had a good night's sleep afterwards. Thank God Hotel Tonight was there to get me there. It sounds counterintuitive, but unlike flights, hotel rates usually get cheaper at the last minute, and Hotel Tonight helps hotels sell their unsold rooms, allowing them to pass those deals on to you. These aren't last resort places. I can attest to this. I stayed in a lovely spot. Uh, they're actually cool, top-rated hotels that you want to stay in, and with so many partner hotels in a ton of different countries, Hotel Tonight can help you find a great hotel almost anywhere. It's perfect for a spontaneous guest away or finally going on that trip you've been waiting to take for a long time because even though the app's name is hotel tonight you can still book up to a week in advance so it's great last second it's great sort of mid medium midterm 
planning. You know, not long-term planning. All it takes is 10 seconds, just three taps and a swipe. So get in on these killer last-minute deals and download the Hotel Tonight app now. Andy, today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by a Game of Thrones Enhanced Edition. This is exciting. For people who uh, have been listening to us for a while, listening to us talk about Game of Thrones across many podcasts and television shows, they know one thing. They know we have been book agnostic. Yeah, I would say that we like to read. I love to read. But we have not been, uh, we've never made the time, nor have we maybe found the right way to get into the Game of Thrones books, but I feel like the winds of winter are starting to change. Oh, you know what I they're mean. blowing in the positive catch direction. catch my freezing cold drift. The, these uh, Game of Thrones Enhanced Edition books, which are available um, on iBooks, are really cool, I have to say. This whole idea of, you know, we talk about on TV a lot, like the second screen experience. This is a way to read the books and have a full immersive interactive experience while you're doing it. For example, at the beginning of every chapter of these enhanced editions, there is a map showing you where the character is and where he is in relation to the rest of the world. Anytime a character is introduced, you can click on the character's name and no more wikipedia no, while that? you're reading. Yes. Literally, who is that? <laughs> yeah. Where have we seen this person before? How are they related? There are author notes from George R. R. Martin. It's all can I mean, there are few stories as interconnected as A Song of Ice and Fire. See, I even know what it's called. Yeah. Uh, These enhanced editions show us all the connections. Yeah, Game of Thrones enhanced editions basically replicates the best parts of Game of Thrones fandom. The cool thing about this story is it's not just a story. It's also history. It's also geography. It's also mythology. It's all these things. And you really do feel the multidimensional element of George R. R. Martin's story come to life in uh, in a way that almost, you know, I wouldn't say the show doesn't do, but I would say that it, it is an indispensable tool for anybody who is already very familiar with Game of Thrones. Maybe yeah. you're doing a reread. Maybe you've been inspired by Binge Mode. You want to do a rewatch or whatever. But if you're rereading these books and you want to learn more, or if it's your first time through, it is, I, I can't imagine it, reading them it, without this If one. you are a fan of the TV show like we are, and maybe you're a little just intimidated by the the, the heft and breadth of this story and all the extra characters that you're going to have to keep track of, this is the way to go into it. Here's the thing. These enhanced editions are available exclusively on iBooks. So go to apple.co slash Game of Thrones. I'll say it again. Apple.co slash Game of Thrones to check them out. They're not available in every country, but I, they're probably available. Probably anywhere. available where you're listening. I have to say that, you know... It, if you're if you've been thinking about starting to read these books like Andy and I have, I mean, I think we always sort of joked about it, but we did always feel at a slight disadvantage because we didn't quite know everything about these characters and everything about this world. I can't I can't think of a better way to start, and I can't wait to think of a better way to jump right into this with than the a Game of Thrones enhanced editions. It is a lot of fun. I mean, reading books on e-readers, iPads has been great, but this is the first example I've seen of, of taking something great, like reading, and making it even better. A Game of Thrones Enhanced Editions. Greenwald, we're back. I want to talk a little bit about hotels. Well, I guess I want to talk a little bit about Disney. Um, not Hotel Tonight. Well, not Hotel Tonight, no. So the D23 convention was this weekend in Anaheim. It's Disney's big uh, shindig where they announce a lot of, like, we've been, we can talk a little bit about, like, Marvel stage phase three or we're, four or we're whatever. Gonna. Especially some some great public appearances by some of our favorite don't, movie stars. Don't burn it. We're not going to talk it. about it. But I want to get really quickly into this uh, thing that was in, unveiled uh, at D23. A Star Wars inspired themed resort at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Uh-huh. Now, I may or may not have spoken about this in the past. I love Disney World. I like, I mean, it was a very big thing for me when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I used to stay at um, Caribbean Beach. Did you? Yeah, I loved it. And I, I stayed at the one the monorail went through. Yeah, I 19, did not have monorail access. I just had a bus. So there's um, 1983, that's when you went? Yeah. So you were six? Yeah, six. Okay. I I, I did like a little Ep- later. Than Epcot that. had just opened. I, I did, you know, 26, 27, 28. When I went. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> when I went, Epcot had just opened and... You know how in actual Disney World, there are people dressed up as Mickey and Goofy and yes. they're wandering around. In Epcot, in the early years of Epcot, you know, there's a part of Epcot that's like uh, nations. And you visit the countries and like eat teriyaki in yeah, Japan yeah, yeah. or whatever. You go on a log flume <laughs> in Norway. They had The shit goes backwards and a troll jumps out at you. Don't undersell the don't flume. Don't spoil it. What? They, they, you guys got to know about the flume. But here's what they don't know. Yeah. The kids. Is that back then, at each country, they had giant... Dress up, cosplay, ethnic stereotypes. <laughs> they look like Russian nesting dolls 
with like weird like doll faces and it was like Norwegian lady. So in addition to pictures of me with like Captain Hook or whatever, some, there's compromise. Some there's, racist there's photographs. There's literally of you. pictures of me <laughs> with a blow up version of Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Nice. They this was a different time. Okay, so they're opening up this Star Wars themed hotel in Disney World. I don't know when they're going to open this up. Probably take Pro- a couple years. To probably never. Out. It's a terrible idea. My man Bob Chapek, the uh, the chairman of Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. A Here's former some, colleague I'm of going us. straight. I could go to a various mm. aggregated news stories. I'm going straight to DisneyParks.Disney.Go.com. Do you have that bookmarked? Yes. And according to Bob... Uh, this revolutionary new vacation experience will be a living adventure that allows guests to immerse themselves in an entirely new form of Disney storytelling. Quote, it is unlike anything that exists today. From the second you arrive, you will be part of a Star Wars story, exclamation point. You'll immediately become a citizen of the galaxy and experience all that entails, including dressing up in the proper attire. Once you leave Earth, you will discover a starship alive with characters, stories, and adventures that unfold all around you. It is 100% immersive, and the story will touch every single minute of your day and will culminate in a unique journey for every person who visits. So, the hotel... Every room in this hotel, apparently, mm-hmm. instead of a window with a view and actual UV rays coming through the window to let mm-hmm. you know it's mm-hmm. daytime, is a fucking window that looks into outer space. Yeah. Right. What does this all sound like? It sounds like Westworld. Spoiler. It sounds like Westworld. Yeah. What's the point? Yeah. You find out. Okay. <laughs> I'm really excited because in Westworld, if you had just been like, do you want to be a cowboy? Number 96 out of yeah. 100 reasons why I would want to be a cowboy is to go have sex. Right. I, I just like prostitution. That's not high in your list. Sexual adventures yeah. was never part of it. In fact, I would venture, I would, I would like to pro- propose that when I watch Westerns, I'm never like, man, it would be dope to have sex in the Old West. Yes. It seems it's like, like the easiest thing. For fastest track to dying was having sex. And these were people who just died of polio every day for no reason at all. Can you imagine being someone who fires up True Grit and just like, yo, I like Rooster Cogburn, but what if he fucks, though? That's what I'm saying. So that was always my the fucking funniest thing about Westworld to me. Now they're building it, right? But here's the thing. Yeah. I have never, if 96 <laughs> out of 100 things that I would care about the Old West would be like, and you know, maybe on like a cold night, I'd love some like human contact. I've never thought that about Star Wars. No. Now, granted, this is a Disney production. I don't think that they will yeah. be like, welcome to the Moss Eisley Whorehouse. <laughs> but isn't that the first thing you think of? Like Westworld has ruined this idea now. But- so I'm just like, what salacious, grotesque, alien orgy will you be participating in in greater or, Orlando? Or like, hooray, let's check into a hotel that is under the thumb of an intergalactic fascist <laughs> regime. But that's the thing. It's like, if somebody comes to me and yeah. it's just like, damn, you know what? I've been saving up and instead of going to Paris or, yeah. or Croatia, I'm going to fucking Florida to live inside of a fake <laughs> spaceship. I'll be like, what disgusting thing are you going to do with yourself in Florida? <laughs> First of all, and that question is evergreen. And if they haven't evergreen. thought of this, yeah. why haven't they thought of this? Because I'm telling you, the black market yeah. on this thing is going to be insane. It's going to be so rich. <laughs> it's like Star Wars drugs. St- like, what's the Star Wars? red light district like how much extra do you have to pay for your room to have like someone in slave leia costume (laughs) with chains do you know what i mean like if you go down to the (laughs) how many bitcoins is that how many bitcoins how many disney dollars to have the hut package to have an an obese floridian just tell you how it's gonna be you know what i mean all you have to do (laughs) Oh my god, man. So that's This is a terrible idea. But is it is it cool yeah. though? Is it, it would you like if you could be wedge, no. if they were like congratulations, like Here, you're wedge. Here's what they forget. Let's go like shoot like no? Here's what they forget. Actors who are method acting are super annoying to hang out with. So let me tell you something. Every every MFA undergraduate at the University of Central Florida will be just making extra bucks, dressing up as uh, bounty hunters. As a tauntaun tamer. Right. Yeah. Who's wandering around <laughs> on an 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. shift in the lobby. You know what I mean? Being like, yeah. hey, I, I don't even yeah. I mean, like, you want me to check your phaser for you? That's Star Trek. I failed. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, 
that's going to be so annoying. But I just want to know, like, can you get a bad story? Like, what if they're like, welcome to Florida, get in this trash compactor, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> it's like, shoot your way out of this garbage. <laughs> it's not, first of all, smuggler. <laughs> first of all, welcome to Florida, asshole, shoot yourself out of this garbage is actually, it's actually the state motto. It's on the license plate. It actually it is. is on the motto. It yeah. is. My my final question is, what happens when uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller show up? <laughs> and they're like, we got a story for you guys. How does that play? Oh, man. Um, okay, so that I'm going to be keeping my eye on that story. First of all, I know it didn't count as one, but that was a Hotel Tonight read. <laughs> because you're basically saying, bad hotel experience, good That's hotel right. experience. Um, what else from this weekend of Marvel I, news I, do you want to talk about? Marvel and Disney news. I just want to talk about how... Oh, Part really of, quickly, just while we're still on Star Wars, yeah. they did they did release this behind the scenes video. I didn't see it yet. Of uh, Last Jedi, and um, it looks dope. Everyone seems to be having a good time, it, right? It just like also like the sincerity with which Daisy Ridley and everybody is just like Ryan Johnson yeah. is that dude, yeah, and just wrote like a very surprising, beautiful script. I just can't. I'm really excited. Me for this too. Movie. I, I it, can't believe it's it's coming in December. It also is I feel the, like it's sneaks it's sneaking up on me. It's the perfect timing here because. Everyone had such a – there was such goodwill coming off of Force Awakens yeah, yeah, yeah. that definitely outweighed – even people can now say, well, the movie wasn't great in a lot of ways, but boy, it's back and the experience is great. The cast is great. So they're all feeling it. They're vibing off of it. They were probably feeling great filming this movie because of the success of the first one. Then they come in with one filmmaker who's just like, relax, I got this. Right. This is all set up to be a good film. Right. Um, I just wanted to talk about briefly the modern uh, experience of being an actor obviously involves – An actor in one of these like – well, huge temple no, franchises. I mean, it's full stop. You basically have to engage with the mo- the mainstream culture of cinema now yeah. to be an actor. You can be Brie Larson and you can win an Oscar and you can be in The Glass Castle, but you're also going to do Captain Marvel. You basically dip a toe in, right? It, it, it's just everyone everyone is dirty at some point or everyone is caking up at one point. What they don't talk about is to do this then, you also have to engage with fan culture in a totally different way. Um it's been interesting to read these interviews with like Dana Ashbrook, who played Bobby on Twin Peaks. Yeah. And the questions are, you know, they're polite ways of saying, what have you been doing for 25 and years? It's, he's been going to conventions. Going to conventions. Yeah. Just going to London, going with, hanging out with Cheryl Lee and other people who are on that circuit. There is a slightly like, you know, prestige version of that. But that but now it is to be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe means when they call you and tell you to get a car to Anaheim or to San Diego and re- come out on stage and wave and smile and pal around with people you maybe hate. You got to do it. I don't either. I don't either. But so so they did this Infinity War thing with like 30 people came out. And yeah. They all put their arms around each other and the Russo brothers. And it all seemed good. And they good. had like WWE entrances. Like yeah, they, they would get announced psyched. and then they'd be like, yeah. I feel like everyone is on board, but I do just want to flag Paul Bettany. Yeah, man. Let's fucking talk about Paul, man. Paul, all the other dudes, they know they show up in a, like a distressed gray T-shirt. Maybe they throw a leather jacket over it. Everyone wants to be in your Ruffalo because that guy just puts his arms around people like nobody's business. Everybody's thrilled. They welcome the newcomers in. They probably all know the best spots to go in Atlanta. There's a Schlotsky's I've heard about. It's not bad. Um, Bettany. <laughs> Bettany. Bettany seemed to arrive directly on the express flight from the island of Dr. Moreau. Yeah, he's been doing, uh, pl- playing a one-man show of Colonel Mustard in <laughs> yeah. a fucking dinner theater somewhere on the island of Dr. Moreau. He shows up in white linen mm-hmm. with a collar taller than Don Cheadle, yeah, which I know isn't saying much. Tinted, like, Morpheus sunglasses from The Matrix, like, where he's just, like, you expect him to just be like, what if I told you? You know, it, nobody wanted to be near Bettany, is what I'm saying. <laughs> now, is he method acting? Is Classic he like, vision, yeah. I'm a synthesoid, yeah. and this is just, I'm not human, or is he actually not human? I don't know. I mean, I think that he's, he initially, him and Renner, anecdotally, mm-hmm. from, like, my, my read of the blogs, like, over the t- last 10 years. Yeah, you check the blogs. Are the most sort of, like, not cynical. Renner is just often, like, I have no idea what's happening in these movies. They yeah. tell me to show up and shoot a bow and arrow, and then I break both of my arms. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, next thing I know, I've been, like, you know, he's just, like, I just tell me where to stand. But, yeah. like, it's kind of very, like, these movies don't quite make sense to me. Bettany has been even more just, like, I'm not not like mean about it, but I think was like this was like, sure, I'll play the like the butler for a minute. And then was like, now I'm in nine movies and I'm a major character in the Avengers. He definitely in some ways he it's a big W because he gets to be in the biggest movies in the world. I'm sure he gets paid well and he's very good in that part. Um, But in other ways, it's the it's actually the reverse Downey because the brilliance of 
Robert Downey Jr.'s career right now is he makes all the money in the world, has all the fun he wants for a part that is essentially them filming his head in front of a green screen. Yeah, at least and they can lot, remote control well, the suits. I mean, like, he did a lot of stuff in Civil War, but in Spider-Man, he is essentially like... He, yeah. What I'm saying is they can dial it back. He can either... He, he doesn't have to do that much. He's if like he Adam want Schefter to. shooting a hit for Sports Center and Spider Man. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's the reverse for Bedney, who started as just voiceover being sort of pithy. Yeah. And then now has to spend nine hours getting painted red. That's because you, you can you imagine like whoever told Bedney, like, you've got to get in on this voiceover kick, man. Yeah. It's so great. It's you so just sweet. like you go in for three months and the next thing you know, you're a panda. <laughs> but like <laughs> Bedney is like, sure, okay, cool. Like I could just like, you know, I'll buy the Quaker school then. Like yeah. I'll just be and he goes in and he does two things where he's like a butler, and then the next thing you know, he's like having some like deeply emotional relationship with Scarlet Witch. You yeah. know, like, it's it's insane. But in full body paint. Yeah, I know. So I guess he can be forgiven for not wanting to go to Anaheim. Well, maybe he did, and it's just like he's playing, it's a bit. He's, like, doing a bit. He's like, everybody knows. You know who was psyched to be in Anaheim? Who? Mackie. Oh, yeah. Mackie Mac- is just, Mackie can turn it on. Mackie and Stan. Mackie and Stan were really ready yeah. to hang. Um, what else do we have? Okay, so that's pretty much it. Like, they're wrapping up uh, Phase 3, with these two Avengers movies. Yeah. And then the Phase 4 stuff, I think, is... Is that Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Ant-Man 2? I guess so. Yeah. Um, although some of those... will Black Panther will come out before the second Avengers movie. Oh, okay. Um, so that's part of Phase 3. I, I guess. So I, we'll, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll dive deeper into this. They, when they, they finally, showed footage. They showed of, footage. Of so Roland I, getting brolic on planet Earth. Um, Are the, you prepared the for that? Thanos, like, they're, they're just like... Thanos is, is a heat check. Could be. Are you prepared for break? prepared for this level Josh of Josh Swollen? <laughs> Josh has been lifting weights, dog. Of course he has. He's been getting brolic. This is this Josh is Brolic. Josh Brolic or Josh Swollen. Yeah. Either way, it's it's happening. Um let's do an abrupt curveball left turn. Let's switch to TV. Yeah, sure. Or streaming television. Are you less, less interested in this? Of course I'm. I mean, I have no like long, ter- you know, long form imitation of a of an MFA student living in Central Florida. <laughs> I, I want to talk about Master of None. Yeah, man. I finished this quite a while ago, so as did many people. I'm gonna sit in the back seat. The for this response one. to this was rapturous. Uh, Emmy nominated across the board. Raves profiles of Aziz mm-hmm. uh, for his artistic. Um, abilities and uh, vision and integrity and this is I finished the season and I have a reaction that I I'm gonna I'm gonna try out with you here because basically I felt a little frustrated Good. this isn't by going it. out to anyone so we no. just, just this is a private it's moment for intimate us. I feel a little frustrated by the show okay and I don't know if that is legitimate but as a former and still Struggling to you don't have to preface critic. it. Your 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 opinions are valid no matter how you I, you make your money. These I days. think, for the most part, the show sidles up to really interesting things, and then parks. Okay, and never gets out of the car. So, the, but it like literally gets stuck in the alley like they did in, in the second episode. Exactly right. Yeah, and when you're kind of stuck and you're not going all the way towards it, and you're not retreating, humor doesn't work as well there either. The jokes are, the show is medium funny across the board. And, and I say this, there are episodes that are better than others. There are moments that are legit hilarious and insightful and interesting. And the performances are often terrific. But I want more from this show. Now, I, when, the reason why I'm sort of hedging is because I don't want to discredit what the show just, just does by existing. That the very legitimate arguments of representation on television, on streaming, in comedy, in the sort of ambitious small screen filmmaking that we're seeing here, those need to be those arguments need to be made, and the show sustains. Them. Yeah, you know. I also think that there's we're, we're not getting another show about Muslim millennials eating pork. Right. That's. That I was... also think that there's okay. So there's a couple. I think one of the things to the key to understanding Master of None, um, which, I, which I liked very much the second season, um, and I think that it's like several distinct shows yes. that were packaged together as a season, and I don't mind that. At all, like I think that we've kind of like this is not unlike the conversation about Baby Driver, where we're we're coming back to the degree to which expectations or the degree to which packaging, the degree to which how we watch something affects how we feel about it, what we think of it, and I, which is not to discredit what you're saying, which I think is like completely valid that it gets very close to revelatory ideas and statements, and then kind of like coasts into there's a there's a retreat often, 
as if, and it reminds me of the internet, which is to say, if just by being right about an issue, that's enough. So Bobby Cannavale is is Josh Brolic this season mm-hmm. on the show as Chef Jeff. Anthony Brolic Dane. Yeah, we will workshop that. <laughs> one. At the end of the season, it's revealed that he is a serial uh, abuser of women, and that sort of is a problem for Dev. Uh-huh. The show successfully articulates the insidious ways that sexual harassment can work for people. You know, there's the scene where Dev talks to the makeup lady about how it worked for her and how she didn't press charges or anything because she just wanted to move on with her life. Mm -hmm. Dev is correct in his opinion about Chef Jeff and what it means for their future together and their friendship, and then it walks away. I'm not saying the show needed to be about sexual harassment, but in that and in a number of other ways. I mentioned the Muslims and Pork thing. The episode ended with them saying, this is how I feel, and everyone's saying, okay. This speaks to, I think, my bigger criticism about the show which is that Dev, Aziz Ansari's character, is flawless. He's essentially always right, always pretty cool, always knows the right restaurants to go, the right pasta to order, the right suits to wear, and it never pushes past that. Well, it's it's, it's hard to be aspirational and relatable, right? True. So there is a degree which we always reward shows for creating a world, and this is obviously a world that we want to spend time in because you and I both like a nice cocktail and a nice meal and sure. good furniture and all these things. That I you, wish I could wear blazers like, yeah, like those guys. Like, I, I, I think that that's what I was sort of talking about where religion, New York, I love you, first date, Thanksgiving, those are all one package. Then there's the bookend Antonioni mm-hmm. and Woody Allen homages mm-hmm. that are the, the two Italian episodes in the beginning and the, and the last and the, the second hour, last one. and the second to last one and the last one about Francesca, right? Mm-hmm. And then in between there's some hijinks there's some st- other stuff. But for the most part, I think that this is essentially two two almost different stories. Yeah. And that and that the in a way, it would have been good to make a five episode season about Francesca and then kind of have like five episodes that were I, just like these sketches that he does of New York City living. I I guess. I, I, I can appreciate that, but I also like the fact that they were trying to I love to, I, to, I'm to, fine to, with them putting to, it all to, together. To and that's the thing about Netflix is it comes up, it's not like I'm thinking, oh well, you know, like from last week to this week, it really didn't just, transition to those two things. It's, it's just, like this is just like a bunch of stuff to watch. It's just what I mean is this is a role that I think Aziz is comfortable playing. Mm-hmm. You know, in his he is not very confessional in any ways. You know, both having talked to him in person, but also the way he presents himself on stage and the characters he writes for himself. Right. Um and we compare this show to other auteurish comedies or comedians, um, but the thing that unites Donald Glover, Louis C.K., even Woody Allen, is they take the scalpel to themselves, and they can show themselves in less than flattering lights, or their own neuroses, or their own, you know. Uh, I think that there's anxieties. some stuff, especially towards the end of the season, about Dev's jealousy. And and I, I think he gets. A, I think that was pretty weak sauce. That part of okay. It. You know, I, I think that that episode, the second to last episode, um, where it's basically they have a relationship for a month but they never kiss. First of all, it is beautifully directed. Mm-hmm. Aziz can direct. That is gorgeous. Everything about New York and that, and Storm King, and the seasons, and the snow, and the colors, and the lighting. I mean, this guy is super talented. But that episode was for as much as it celebrated something that is always fun and romantic. And I really liked the romance of the season. That was something that I liked best, actually. I, I really liked the, the episode where he takes Francesca to Chef Jeff's dinner and there's that long Michael Clayton graduate tracking shot of the whole ride home in the taxi yeah. that we haven't really seen before. And I loved the way it made me feel. I loved that performer who played Francesca. But that episode just, and then to the finale, turns on him being like, you used me. And he sort of just turns into a, a dude in a, in a kind of snipey way. It, it didn't, show us anything it didn't go anywhere further emotionally it was just here's an emotional situation that might we might understand and we can relate to yeah you know and and i i I frustrated because the talent is so enormous elsewhere because new york i love you is such a wonderful episode i want more yeah it's a sumptuous show the music all the paradise garage music all the like the so well photography is great the the setting is like i i completely understand that you that there is a there there problem yeah Yeah. that even thanksgiving which was emmy nominated and um is you know Aziz wrote with Lena Waithe, and it's her life, and it, he was very generous to give her that stage to tell that. And Angela Bassett is in this episode, mm-hmm. and holy cats, is she good in it. At the end of that episode, I did feel like I was I was told a story, not necessarily that I was shown a story. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
and and then what you're saying about aspiration, that's just the final point to make about it. That that I, again, I think it sort of frustrates me a little bit, which is everyone's like, "What a love letter to New York." I don't really recognize this New York. Now, maybe this is a millennial New York or a very well-off 30-something New York that I wasn't a part of. Um, but honestly, Spider-Man Homecoming felt more in love with New York to me than this did. Because in Spider-Man Homecoming, there is a extended riff on a bodega that makes good sandwiches, and there's a cat in the bodega. And then later with Donald Glover, like there's, they talk about the sandwiches, and that unites them. That felt New York to me. I think the, 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 the it, cool it, thing about New York for me is that Spider-Man Homecoming... Master of None and Richard Price's Lush Life could all be about New York, and they could all that's be about fair. like somebody's idea of New York. That, that's fair, but the but I I I'm, I am curious why it's a popular joke to talk about Chandler's apartment on or Monica's apartment on Friends, and not talk about just the effortless comfort and wealth of Master <laughs> of None. Now, I'm not saying that's the fun way to watch the show. What's we the cupcake show he's on? We, uh, Clash of the Cupcakes. Clash of, maybe it just pays well. Everything works out for him. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily make good comedy, is my point. That, that's all. That's, I mean, No, it's a good point. His apartment is gorgeous. <laughs> I wish that I was young and childless enough to go to these bars in, Man, in, in Williamsburg. Yeah. This is jealousy. Yeah. There's no question. But I want a tougher show. That's all I want. I'm grateful we have it. But that was that that was that's my that's my bit. You made me think, and that's all I could ask. Did for. I? Yeah, man. We'll be back on Thursday. We're gonna talk uh, Twin Peaks. We'll wrap up Glow. Yes. Uh, then Monday, the following, we'll probably you know just be back on our thrones. Sunday nights, talk the thrones on Twitter. You can find us at twitter.com/ringer. You can find us on our Twitter feeds. Binge mode is on Wednesdays for the deep dive into the world of Game of Thrones with Mal and Jason. Uh, you can catch us every Sunday. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Great job, Bransky! Bring your podcast network. Today's episode of The Watch was brought to you by Insecure Season 2 creator and star Issa Rae is back with a brand new season of her deeply relatable HBO series set in Inglewood. Season 2 of Insecure finds Issa dealing with the fallout of her infidelity and resulting breakup with long-term boyfriend Lawrence. Despite her attempts to maintain a positive facade, Issa secretly hopes that she can win him back. Meanwhile, Lawrence begins to move forward without her. Bye, Lawrence. This summer, Insecure isn't holding back and life is hella out there. Watch the season two premiere of Insecure July 23rd at 10.30 p.m. on HBO. Today's episode of The Watch was brought to you by a Game of Thrones enhanced edition. Andy, George R.R. Martin's Game of Thrones. Uh, it's it, There's a new iBooks version of this called uh, Enhanced Editions, and it is just bringing these storylines, these characters to life in a fun and interactive way. If you, like us, have been on the fence about reading the Song of Ice and Fire series, the five books that have been out there informing the TV show that we all know and love, this is the time to get in. These books are really, really cool. The enhanced edition to every chapter, there is a map showing you where the characters are. Every character name is clickable for a hyperlink explaining who they are, what their sigil is, what the heck they're doing, and where they've been. It is the most immersive way to experience George R. R. Martin's crazy in-depth books. You go from ba- being like basically a remedial fan of this story to being a professor of this story. These books are available exclusively on iBooks. You can go to apple.co slash Game of Thrones. Again, apple.co slash Game of Thrones. Check them out. They are not available in all countries, but they are probably available where you live. And if you've been thinking about getting into the books or if you've read the books and wanted a more deeply immersive, interactive experience, can't recommend this more highly. It's George R.R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones Enhanced Editions.